award winners, members of the Riksdag, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure that I welcome you all to the Swedish Parliament, Riksdagen. The Right Livelihood Award is present to pioneers who work for a better world. We are here today to participate in the honoring of the three of those pioneers and one organization that have been a appointed recipient at the 2010 Right Livelihood Award. They have all worked for a better world and show us good examples of how to face the challenges that are posed to the global community. This year is also the anniversary of the Right Livelihood Award. It was founded in 1980 and the prize has been awarded to pioneers who in some crucial way have been working for a better world. I am also proud that the prize ceremony have been in the Swedish Riksdag since 1985. The prize is also a, raising, a way of raising awareness of issues that concern all of us. The challenge that we face when it comes to work for a better environment, elimination of poverty and lasting peace. These themes are, or at least should be, highly relevant for the work of parliamentarians all over the world. But we also need to be remembered of how important individual initiative, integrity and courage are, and what you can achieve when you work for something you believe in. In many parts of the world, people are living through wars and conflicts, in social difficult condition, with poverty, a lack of liberty, bad environment condition, and inadequate human rights. Democra democracy and respect for human rights do not come to us automatically. This is something we must con constantly struggle for. You who have been awarded the Right Livelihood Award have all demonstrated the outstanding integrity and personal courage. In your work, you have helped many people in this, their everyday lives. Dear recipients, you will in a short while receive the awards. For me, it is a great honor and pleasure to open this ceremony. On behalf of the Swedish Riksdag, I wish you warmly welcome you here today. I congratulate you on what you have done so far and wish you all luck in your continuous work. I now give the floor to Eva Lena Jansson, chairperson of the Society for the Right Livelihood Award in the Swedish Riksdag. Thank you for the attention. Deputy Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eva-Lena Jansson and I am a member of the Swedish Parliament representing the Social Democratic Party. As the chair of the Society for the Right Livelihood Award in the Swedish Parliament, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all tonight for this happy occasion where we get to honor people who work for a more just, equal and truly sustainable planet. I hope you will learn some new things and enjoy the speeches and music this evening. In order for all of us to fully experience this ceremony, uh, we ask you to kindly turn off your mobile phone. You have one? I have one. I have turned it on. Turn, uh, and now take not, do not take any photographs with flashes during the actual ceremony. During the intermission, the laureates will stay up here for you to be able to take really good pictures. We also ask the photographers to not move close to the stage since they will disturb both our guests and well as the filming uh, for TV and the webcast. Thank you for attention and now let me welcome Jakob von Yxkull, the founder and chairman of the Right Livelihood Award. Welcome Jakob, the floor is yours. Honorable Deputy Speaker and Members of Parliament, dear award recipients, excellencies, friends. Recently, the Right Livelihood, right livelihood Award family lost one of its most active members, Hermann Scheer, 
the German parliamentarian who dedicated his life to promote renewable energies worldwide. Over 60 countries now have feed-in tariff laws based on the German legislation which Scheer conceived and got adopted by providing a guarantee to small producers of renewable energy that their investments will pay off and spreading the costs among all electricity consumers, this law has led to a rapid expansion in renewable energy production and created hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Scheer highlighted the ethical imperative to use and not waste the massive daily energy potential of the sun and to abandon fossil fuels before they run out and destabilize our climate. Scheer also initiated IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, founded last year, which already has almost 150 member governments. Please join me in a moment of silence to celebrate the life and work of Hermann Scheer. Thank you very much. Today we are the guardians of all future generations of life on Earth. The consequences of our actions and our inaction will have greater and longer term consequences than ever before. This is an unprecedented responsibility which we cannot escape. There is, of course, the risk that this unique historical moment will encounter too small a people, a generation not up to the challenge, leaving our children and their descendants with a world radically diminished in resources and options. Why did past civilizations fail? Because they clung for too long to those now outdated values rules and structures which previously had assured their greatness. But their failures were always localized, not globalized. Globalization has enabled us to postpone natural limits for a few more decades by growing into the economic and ecological space of other countries. As a consequence, we are now approaching global peak everything with a risk of simultaneous collapse in many areas, peak oil, peak water, peak fish, peak phosphate, etc., unless we change course drastically in the next few years. We need to be ready to rethink and, if necessary, change every aspect of our lives and societies. We're entering a new era, increasingly at the mercy of natural forces we have careless, carelessly unleashed for natural laws cannot be overturned by political decisions. Debts to nature will not be discounted or forgiven. Growing deserts, melting glaciers, and falling fish stocks are not amenable to negotiation or political deals. In 1994, 1,500 of the world's top scientists, including a majority of living Nobel Prize laureates, warned that, quote, we are fast approaching many of the Earth's limits. Current economic practices that damage the environment in both developed and underdeveloped nations cannot be continued without the risk that vital global systems would be damaged beyond repair." End of quote. So unlike failed past civilizations, we were warned in time. We were also told long ago what is required. Almost 20 years ago in Rio, the world's nations including the USA under President Bush Sr., endorsed the Agenda 21 Plan of Action. According to the Earth Summit strategy to save the planet, quote, effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities 
of both governments and individuals and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action be integrated into individual and collective decision-making at every level. Yet our current global order has shown itself to be too rigid and inflexible to deal with a crisis which increasingly threatens the entire life support systems of our civilization and species. Today, if drastic measures are not taken to slow the accelerating climate chaos, we face a radically transformed world much more hostile to the survival and flourishing of life. Yet we still honor economists who seriously believe that, as climate change will mainly, mainly affect agriculture, which only represents about 3% of GDP in industrialized countries like the USA, there would not really be a problem. To quote Professor Thomas Schelling, recipient of the 2005 Nobel Foundation Economics Prize, if agricultural productivity were drastically reduced by climate change, the cost of living would rise by one or two percent at a time when per capita income will likely have doubled. In other words, as long as we produce enough iPods, computers and financial derivatives, collapsing food production does not really matter. In real life, standards of living will fall as we are forced to spend an increasing portion of national budgets on defensive and precautionary measures. Our way of life and the expectations of the billions who want to share it is based on the abundant availability of cheap energy. The climate stabilization imperative as well as approaching supply peaks are ending that era as the energy return on investments falls. The consequences will be seismic and dramatic. These are not the only emergencies now facing us, but they will make all others much harder to deal with. As glo growing global unemployment and income gaps, both in and between nations, threaten the moral legitimacy of our current economic order, increasingly seen as ineffective and unjust. In a competitive world of growing resource scarcities, violent conflicts will multiply. Wealthy societies have so far experienced only a tiny fraction of the unstoppable immigration they will face. The stream of economic and environmental refugees will become a torrent unless we can mobilize the moral leadership and mutual trust required to change our global rules and institutions to reflect these new realities. International sport functions because its rules are seen as fair and thus mutually acceptable. We now need to apply the same standards to global economic and political rules. Even in the USA, every fourth child is now dependent on government food vouchers. According to the US Ministry of Agriculture, last year 50 million US citizens went through periods when they did not have enough to eat. A clear majority in the previously optimistic USA now expect their children to have a worse quality of life. The American dream, still pursued by the global majority, is turning out to have been just that, a dream. So it's easy to despair, but these awards have shown for 30 years today that there are other paths, other models of progress which do not cost the Earth. We have many early warning systems. This award provides early solutions. The first two Abu Dhabi Syed Future Energy Prizes founded last year went to Right Livelihood Award recipients, Professor Martin Green and Dr. Dipal Barua, former managing director of our laureate organization, Gramin Shakti. I admit that I'd hoped and expected that we would have had more impact by now. A few years ago, I spoke of these awards as no longer being alternative, but the new mainstream. But I, I underestimated the stubborn short-sightedness and fears of the defenders of the status quo. As the British economist John Maynard Keynes once said, it is much easier to invent the new than to overcome the old. The evidence all around us shows that we are rapidly heading towards the point of no return when changes that everybody thought were impossible 
become matter of fact. Whether this, this happens before global chaos overwhelms us depends on every one of us, uniquely privileged to live at this most exciting and demanding moment of creative opportunity in the whole of human experience. Recently, we commemorated the 15th anniversary of the murder of our laureate, the Nigerian poet and environmental activist, Ken Saroviva. A few years ago, our executive director, Olaf von Uxkul, visited Saroviva's Ogoni people in Nigeria. It did not take more than a flight over the Niger Delta to see with his own eyes the oil spills on their farmlands and the burning pipelines in their backyards. Today, the situation still continues. Ken Saraviva's enemies killed him, but they did not succeed in extinguishing the torch of his commitment or in silencing the voices of those demanding justice. This year, the Right Livelihood Award jury honors Nemo Basse for revealing the full ecological and human horrors of oil production and for his inspired work to strengthen the environmental movement in Nigeria and globally. Nima Basse recognized the intrinsic link between environmental and human rights many years ago. He joins us here straight from the Cancun Climate Talks, to which he will return tomorrow, to engage in one of the key global challenges we are now facing, securing climate justice. Nima Basse is co-founder and director of Environmental Rights Action Nigeria and the current chair of Friends of the Earth International. He has led supranational initiatives from Africa to Latin America and Southeast Asia to mobilize communities against destructive oil and gas extraction. He combines international advocacy and campaigning with a continued strong commitment on the ground in Nigeria. He, here, he and his colleagues recently won a landmark ruling declaring gas flaring unconstitutional. They monitor oil extraction and make the sheer size of oil spills in Nigeria known to the international public. On average, there is one spill per day. Estimates say that spills equivalent to the size of that of the Exxon Valdez disaster have occurred in the Niger Delta every or every second year. Those who point their fingers at these black wounds, at government corruption, and at the responsibility of transnational corporations, often encounter threats and intimidation. Nima Basse has been forced to go underground, has been arrested and detained, but he is unstoppable. It is therefore with very great pleasure that I present a 2010 Right Lavrid Award to Nima Basse. Bishop Erin Kreutler is honored by the Right Livelihood Award Jury for a lifetime of work for the human and environmental rights of indigenous peoples and for his tireless efforts to save the Amazon forest from destruction. Bishop Kreutler is since many years one of the world's foremost committed and fearless advocates for the rights of indigenous peoples. In the Amazon, the issues are now land grabs, access to resources, and the construction of the world's third largest dam. Some call it development, but in the end, there is no development for the people affected, but only extinction, cultural extinction, as well as the loss of lives and livelihoods and the destruction of habitat and diversity of one of our planet's most valuable ecosystems. When Bishop Kreutler explains the mission that has guided his work for more than four decades, he emphasizes that his aim is not to civilize. Instead, respect and love are his guiding principles. He sees the protection of indigenous people of their right to their culture and to their ancient lands as his Christian duty. Defying powerful interests, Bishop Kreutler fought for granting indigenous groups full constitutional rights, took action against child abusers, mobilized opposition against the Bellomonte Dam, often exposing himself to personal danger. Bishop Kreutler is a lighthouse, not only in his diocese, but internationally.
and it is therefore with very great pleasure that I present the 2010 Reitler Havid Award to Bishop Irving Kreutler. Sapros and its founder, Sri Krishna Upadhyay, are awarded the Right Livelihood Award for demonstrating over many years the power of community mobilization to address the multiple cases of poverty, even when threatened by political violence and instability. The name Sapros stands for Support Activities for Poor Producers of Nepal. Power imbalances exploit the working poor, pressuring them into patron-client relationships and monopolizing lands and markets. This can only be addressed by social mobilization, not by aid. Thus, SAPROS activities are not charity, but empowering the poor to work themselves out of poverty. Nepal, one of Asia's poorest countries, has suffered massively from political instability when those working for the poor had to walk a racist edge between giving continued support to those who need them and protecting members and staff. SAPRO's range of activities include savings and credit groups, cooperatives, the construction of roads and bridges, the installation of latrines, water, photovoltaic and biogas systems, the management of community forests and services like health posts, schools and community buildings. Over the years, more than 235,000 households have benefited from their work. These achievements are the outcome of a sophisticated empowerment process during which the Nepalese villagers express their needs and subsequently invest their own labor and funds in the chosen project. It is this bottom-up approach of social mobilization rooted in Sri Krishna, Sri, Sri Krishna Upadhyay's long experience in development work and his conclusion that top-down development does not work, which symbolizes the success of SAPROS. He underlines the need of the poor to own the process and to manage their resources themselves. Only then can any poverty alleviation and development program have a positive impact on their quality of life while being cost-effective and sustainable. Unfortunately, Sri Krishna Upadhyay is not able to come to Stockholm due to the loss of a close family member. Representing SAPROS and its founder tonight are SAPROS Executive Director Mr. Narendra Bahadur and Sri Krishna Upadhyay's daughter, Dr. Dioti Bhattarai. It is with very great pleasure that I present the 2000 Right Live of the Award to Sri Krishna Upadhyay and Sapros. Physicians for Human Rights Israel, founded by Dr. Ruhama Marton, are awarded the Right Lab Award for their indomitable spirit in working for the right to health of all people in Israel and Palestine. Physicians for Human Rights Israel was initiated in 1988 at the height of the Intifada by Israeli and Palestinian physicians who believe that human rights and medical care are integral parts of the same struggle. Dr. Marton underlines that their main concern is to struggle against wrongs that stem from political conduct rather than illnesses caused by viruses and microbes. In the Middle East, structural violence, to use the term of our laureate Johann Galtung, 
reveals its ugly face when Palestinians have to navigate, sometimes for weeks, even months, the bureaucratic hurdles of crossing into Israel for life-saving medical treatment. It is implicit in the, aggression, in, the, in the oppression of refugees, migrants, and marginalized groups like the Bedouins in the Negev Desert. To counter structural violence, direct medical relief, which Physicians for Human Rights, Israel's medical helpers, deliver daily in hundreds of cases, is not enough. Physicians for Human Rights Israel lobbies the State of Israel, demanding that all residents of Israel and Palestine get the same access and right to health care, regardless of their legal status, nationality, ethnicity, or faith. The medical and direct support activities of Physicians for Human Rights Israel include mobile clinics crossing into Gaza despite the huge obstacles facing such trips, an open clinic in Jaffa which sees over 100 patients each evening, a women's clinic working with Palestinian women to raise awareness about health-related issues, a prisoners and detainees department, a migrants and undocumented people department, a department for stateless persons, including the open clinic, serving over 250,000 people residing in Israel without civil status. A residence of Israel department advocating for a more inclusive Israeli public health system, a right to health in the unrecognized Negev villages project, seeking to promote the right to health for the 180,000 Bedouins there. An occupied territories department, which campaigns against the extreme difficulties residents face when they have to cross checkpoints for medical reasons. Physicians for Human Rights Israel have also, has also started a campaign against the carrying out of anti-anthrax experiments on Israeli soldiers. It is with very great pleasure that I present a 2010 Right Laird Award to Physicians for Human Rights Israel, represented here by its founder, Dr. Ruhama Marton. In conclusion, I would like to thank all those who help keep these awards alive, our partners, circle of friends, and other donors. They share my belief that the best way to bring about change is to highlight and support projects of hope that show us the ways forward. One of our friends is covering the costs for the ceremony tonight, the musicians, the technicians, the guards, the flowers. Others donate towards the prize money and for our work to support our laureates. To those of you who are here tonight, I want to express my gratitude and appreciation. And to those of you who want to know more about how, can you, how you can support the right to have the award, please fill in the orange circle of friends ticket that you find in the program on your desk and hand it to one of us. I will end with this challenging quote from Sir Winston Churchill. It is not enough to do your best. You have to do what is necessary. Thank you very much.
Dear guests, for those of you who want to take picture, now is the time. Outside the, this hall is lingonberry juice and ve vegetarian wraps will be served. A trumpet signal will tell you when it's time to move to the chamber again. So enjoy, and please be back in time. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, three months ago, the Right Livelihood Award Foundation and about 75 of its laureates gathered in Bonn, Germany, on the occasion of the 30th anniversary. Being there, meeting old as well as new friends, it occurred to me how much enthusiasm and energy the idea behind this award, the concept of the Right Livelihood, still calls for. Energy, which last year resulted in the launch of the Right Livelihood College to help harness and spread our laureates' knowledge to a new generation. The college was met an overwhelming interest by our award recipients. The results from Bonn show clearly how important it is to help bridge the gap between activism and academia and to rethink education in general. The representative of the Right Livelihood College, among them scientists from universities from three continents, Addis Abeba University, University in Penang, Malaysia, the Bonn University in Germany, and Lund, Lund University here in Sweden, we are not the only ones to meet and to discuss with our laureates. An incredible group was originally uh, gathering in the youth conference organized by the Youth Future Project themselves under the patronage of the Right Livelihood Award Foundation. 120 young people joining our laureates in their urge to change course. You find outside also their uh, appeal. Please watch the following short film produced by the Youth Fruit, uh, Future Project to feel the energy that draws its strengths from meeting true role models. An energy that too often is underestimated in its power to resonate with young people and to touch lives and really change it and make change happen for all of us. Please watch. <laughs> The young generation is rising to reclaim its future. More than 120 young people from all around the world came together to work with the laureates of the Right Livelihood Award. The Youth Future Conference 2010 in Bonn was organized by the Youth Future Project together with the Right Livelihood Award Foundation. During the last 30 years, more than 130 individuals all around the globe have been working on behalf of our planet against suppressing regimes, injustice, and environmental pollution. They were honored for their outstanding work and vision on behalf of our planet for the Right Livelihood Award. The 30th anniversary of the award was celebrated at the Gustav Stresemann Institute in Bonn, Germany. If you see a problem and you start thinking of an idea, 
don't don't sit with the idea share the idea with somebody test the idea write it down think about it and that is the, a way of sort of like individually and collectively with others that you can really change uh, the world so just don't sit with an idea if you if it's your problem sort of say there must be a solution this is an opportunity I've been part of this group that's now going to work a lot closer together and also work in conjunction with the youth future um, project which is very very ex uh, exciting um, and I thought it was quite wonderful that they in your youth conference here different people took the different laureates and how to look at their lives and their issues and their campaigns and how they achieve success and use that as an inspiration for what young people can do. I thought that was a wonderful connection between the Right Livelihood Laureates and the Youth Future Project. 30 laureates were holding workshops and lectures at the Youth Future Conference. They came from 20 nations to learn from the Right Livelihood Award Laureates. For one week, they were working together at the Youth Future Conference, creating a manifesto and setting the foundation of an international youth network. The Youth Future Project is a non-profit organization for right livelihood and sustainable development. It was founded to support the work of the laureates honored with the Right Livelihood Award. Together with the Right Livelihood Award Foundation, we try to make the work and visions of the laureates public and bring them to the attention of the young generation. We need to make them understand how urgent it is to change our course and reclaim our future. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eva Olofsson. I'm a member of the Swedish Parliament and represent the Left Party. I will introduce to you Dr. Rohama Malton. In 1987, during the First Intifada, Dr. Malton could, no, could not be stopped after observing neglected and run-down hospitals with 30 to 40 years old equipment and hearing the stories from mostly young, wounded Palestinians in Gaza who didn't get the treatment they needed and definitely not as quickly as needed. She set up Physicians for Human Rights Israel in 1988. Recently, she said in a BBC interview, bureaucratic time is different from medical time. In medicine, time is life. You cannot wait to do something which you need to do this very moment. Also, as a psychiatrist, she sees what kind of result the ongoing conflict has, especially on children, both Palestinian and Israeli. She says that she feels that, that it is her personal responsibility to try to change things. Dr. Maton has definitely not wasted her time and she has continued her struggle even though she has been insulted and threatened so many times. We will now have the pleasure to listen to Dr. Rushama Marton, founder and president of Physicians of Human Rights Israel. Welcome, the floor is yours. Good evening. I'm really excited and I'm happy to be here. Uh, 
dear Mr. Speaker and members of Parliament, dear fellow laureates of the Right Livelihood Award, Excellencies, dear friends, and there are a lot of friends here, which makes me so happy. In January 1988, less than a month after the outbreak of the First Intifada, which is the Palestinian uprising against the Israeli occupation, I gathered together a group of 11 Israeli physicians and we went to visit Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza. That visit was a shocking event. We witnessed firsthand the results of the Israeli reaction to the civil uprising. Gunwoods, people who had been clubbed about their heads to the point of unconsciousness, youngsters with broken hand and feet, and more. Shocking, too, was the state of the medical facilities, especially when we compared it with the cutting edge technological standards we were accustomed to in our hospitals inside Israel. El Shifa, you need to know, El Shifa Hospital was a, govern a, a government institution which meant it was under the supervision and the responsibility of the Israeli occupying authorities. Why then, we asked ourselves, was it not of the similar standard to our own? Why were the Palestinian doctors constantly threatened on political grounds? This was the beginning of the Association of Israeli-Palestinian Physicians for Human Rights. Then it became Physicians for Human Rights. More than two decades have passed from a pioneering organization that introduced the concept of human rights to the Israeli public. We have evolved into a leading human rights organization founded by a woman and led by a woman, we established a model of feminist grassroots social leadership, one that was quickly emulated by others. Within a year or two following the founding of Physicians for Human Rights Israel, new NGOs led by women were established making it clear that feminist activism had widened its scope from struggling strictly for women's right to a new capacity in which the whole world was there to change. PHR Israel is now a somewhat older, not only me, more established organization but our commitment to our values has not faltered. We are as resolute in our action and advocacy for ending the occupation, in our struggle for the right to health of Palestinians living under occupation, and of all prisoners and detainees. At the same time, we also widened our activities to protect and promote the rights to health of marginalized communities within Israel. Migrant workers, asylum seekers, residents of the unrecognized Bedouin villages, the poor and those citizens of Israel who suffer discrimination. Physicians for Human Rights Israel works in the backyard of Israeli society. Backyards that many don't want to see and don't care about. Indeed, in Israel today, the discourse of human rights has now become commonplace, which is really good. Yet, 
the respect for human rights has not. Recently, there is growing denunciations of denunciation of members of our human rights community as traitors. Our demand for true equality and our alternative worldview to the militaristic approach in education and in policy making are the main cause for denunciation. The attack is multi-layered. It comes via legislation, the media, right-wing academics and right-wing NGOs. Now, it is a moment of test. It is a moment where a human rights organization under threat should make its stand even clearer and more vocal than before. Physicians for Human Rights Israel, I'm sure, will rise to this task because of our moral and legal tradition of human rights, values of social justice, and principles of medical ethics. All these are combined with a feminist worldview of partnership and solidarity. My way as a woman, sorry, as a woman activist, started long before I established Physicians for Human Rights, long before I knew what radical feminism was, or had had the chance to read some theoretical thinking. Back then, as a female soldier, I struggled against the male-dominated militaristic standards. Later, I struggled against the discrimination of female students in the medical school where we were asked to be grateful for the 10% quota allocated to female students. All these experiences and others, many others, served to train me for a life of activism and enabled me to found PHR Israel and to give it this inherent belief that working for human rights must be done with and not just for the community. This is really important. We are part of the community just as we are physicians. Thus, our obligation to social justice and human rights. We raise our voice with the voiceless, the tortured victims, prisoners, and all disempowered people and groups in our society. We struggle against wrongs that stem from human conduct rather than the illnesses caused by viruses or microbes. We invest in advocating for changing the system or policy that causes the suffering we encounter every day in our clinics and interventions. Our radical political work has influenced various aspects of the Israeli health system, and we played a vital role in the Israeli High Court ruling against torture. Yet, much is still to be done. Solidarity is our guiding principle in our work with Palestinians and with other disempowered and excluding communities. We avoid a patronizing attitude and we reject the philanthropic approach. While engaging in direct medical action for individuals in our mobile and open clinics, or while advocating for individuals whose rights are violated, we learn of the causes of those rights violations. We commit ourselves to finding a radical solution 
and demand accountability from those in power. We are constantly fostering critical thinking that empowers us against the temptation of the beer hug of the mainstream. Because, let me assure you, many wish to silence us by diverting us to charity or to humanitarian work which carries no political message. We don't want it. We do know that there is no humanitarian solution to humanitarian crisis. Humanitarian crisis, even if caused by natural disasters, can be better resolved by just political action, by a just political action. In our gym, region, the disaster is man-made, usually. For all of us, PHR Israel and the human rights community in Israel, the award comes at the right time, or maybe a perfect time. We live in a society that chooses to live a life of deception, believing that Israelis are the only victims, that the long occupation is necessary for security, that we are a true democracy with no racism or xenophobia, no apartheid regime in its way. Voices like ours are attacked so as to silence us. Your supporting voice might have an essential influence on public opinion and policy makers in Israel. The award empowers our friends, volunteers, and members. Without them, our work would not have been possible. For all of us, this award gives a moment of pride and recognition to lives of continuous struggle that is often rebuked, lonely, and rejected. It is not an easy decision for a physician or nurse to join PHR Israel. They are criticized by the peers for being political, as if medicine can be a neutral profession. It is not. Health is used by the regime, not only in Israel, as a mean of controlling its citizens, of undocumented people and Palestinians under occupation. It is through the right to health that we can best struggle against such control and oppression. Today, when NGOs are being delegitimized, especially those advocating human rights for Palestinians under occupation or striving to achieve a more inclusive society, doctors might be hesitant to join us. This state became more and more ethnocentric and democratic values are compromised. Israeli-Palestinian citizens are marked as fifth columns, columnist, sorry. Asylum seekers as a danger to the Jewish character of the state. Anti-occupation activists and the human rights groups as a threat to the existence of the state, as if the only way to maintain Israel is via military control, oppression and humiliation for the other. The result of this well-coordinated attack is a restriction of the public debate that is so essential to any democratic process. At this point in time, the award not only gives recognition to past achievements, but plays a significant role in supporting our present struggle. 
I feel honored to stand here today in the company of the other Loretis. Being acknowledged as having similar resilience and achievements to their is the best reward I could have hoped for. Being one of you is extremely important since I myself and Physicians for Human Rights Israel are in great need of moral support and recognition. I humbly accept this award in the name of Physicians for Human Rights, wonderful and relentless staff, board, volunteers, and membership. In the name of our dear Palestinian partners, and in the name of all who support us. From Israel and from the occupied Palestinian territory, I bring you back their gratitude and their commitment to build society that will not be ashamed of, but rather proud of, sorry, but rather proud of for their conduct towards human rights. Let us join voices and be heard loud and clear, for silence is the language of complicity, but speaking out is the language of change. Thank you very, very much. Little girl, are you lonesome now? Have you lost your head? How long shall we live apart in this big, big Thank you. 
So now it's my turn. It would have been pity to miss that music. Um, honored laureates, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, and dear friends. I'm not Abir Al Salani, as you probably noticed. <laughs> she is very sorry she had to leave in the bread during the break. She, she couldn't uh, present the next laureate. But I'm uh, Marianne Andersson, and I'm uh, a former member of CERL and of this parliament. I belong to the same party as Abir, and I'm now engaged in the Right Livelihood Award Foundation as a, as a board member. Working from uh, bottom up, aiming to create development, is probably the best recipe for poverty reduction. Only through grassroots organizations where individuals are empower, empowered, we can truly create sustainable development. Empowered individuals, when they come together, can move mountains. And the proof of that is Sapros. I have the honor to give the floor to Dr. Narendra Bahadur from the Sapros in Nepal. Dr. Bahadur, the floor is yours. Good evening. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Members of Parliament, 
Excellencies, dear recipients of Right Livelihood Award, and dear friends. It is with regret I am letting you know that Mr. Sri Krishna Upadhyaya mourning for his mother's death at this very moment and unable to join here for receiving prestigious the Right Livelihood Award 2010. My name is Narendra Bahadur Keshi, serving as a director in Sapros, Nepal, representing on his behalf and the organization. I am accompanied by Dr. Jyoti Bhattarai, daughter of Mr. Sri Krishna Upadhi. I also want to welcome our Honorable Ambassador from Nepal to Denmark, Mr. Vijay Karna, who graciously agreed to join the ceremony and came all the way from Copenhagen. My Mr. Sri Krishna Upadhyaya urged me to convey following message to this August Assembly. This is actually the recognition of contribution by the poor of Nepal and who have shown their wisdom and creativity in coming out of poverty. It is an honor for those individuals and organizations that have joined mass movement in community development, managing common property resources, and providing public goods and services in rural areas of Nepal. In this occasion, I want to salute them. This will encourage all of us to continue our mission to develop Nepal as a democratic, peaceful, equitable, inclusive, stable, and important part of world community. I want to thank the jury for recognizing our report in poverty elevation and providing us Right Livelihood Award 2010. <coughs> Dear friends, magnitude of poverty in Nepal is very high with dehumanizing levels in mid and far western region of the country, Nepal has the highest percentage of poor. Almost two-thirds of population are poor. When multi-index, poverty index, MPI, developed by Oxford is used, highest in South Asian region. This level of poverty gives ground for frustration particularly among the youth, resulting in escalated levels of conflict which Nepal has experienced in the past. We had realized that poverty needs to be the main agenda of development and had done some work at the grassroots level. It did not take us long to realize that such efforts through government bureaucratic structures give some results, but not enough at all. We were fed up with the shifting priorities of donors, particularly as they insisted on more emphasis of management of credit operations and less on developmental aspects. Visiting small producers, artisans, and wage earners we had realized that they not only needed financial assistance, but also needed technology, access to market, and above all, capacity building to manage local resources. This required building trust among the people and believe in their wisdom and indigenous knowledge system, subsequently supported by external interventions. Fixing a right match between local resources and external support was important so that the communities do not become overly dependent on external support. During our work with the Small Farmers Development Program, 
we had observed that external pressure to disperse funds without preparation at the grassroots had resulted in over dependency on external resources. We were also not clear on the entry point of intervention, which would trigger development and build faith among poor communities. So we decided to implement an action research project on social mobilization in few villages of Gorkha district in 1991. We started by training social mobilizers and group leaders in the art of building organization of the poor. We tracked for days in those remote villages to learn about their aspirations and talk to them about finding creative solutions. We did not have many resources to share with them except ideas from our past experience. The mutual trust and participatory learning exercise helped us to believe in the capability of poor producers to uplift them. Based upon the action research, we developed the social mobilization manual using pictures because most of the people were liter illiterate. Later on, we made videos and used video projectors going from one village to another, organizing people. Since the model was based upon contradictions in the society, people understood the logic of poor being exploited due to unequal power relations. Once we started building separate organizations of poor, there were considerable resistance from landlords, money lenders, traders, and local politicians. As the small producers became more self-reliant and independent, the conflict came to surface, and some of our staff were even threatened. As savings increased, money lenders were pressured to lower down their interest rate. The wage laborers also benefited, reducing the labor supply to landlord for the cultivation of land. Landless became tenants and started benefiting from access to new technology and growing urban market for vegetable and horticultural products. People were able to, move, uh, to, uh, to meet their food needs and generate some surplus for the market. They were able to send their children to school and there was demand for school buildings and suspension bridges for gaining access to services. As effectiveness of our program increased, news spread, I quote, Sapros does what it says, unquote. Support started pouring and our confidence level increased. We were able to mobilize more and more resources using it more effectively. After gaining experience, we decided to move to other districts and finally went to remotest ones of mid and far western region. Amongst them, Mugu was the most underdeveloped falling lowest in all development indicators with a life expectancy of major 39 years. As you move to that region, Maoist conflict heightened into full-scale civil war covering almost all part of the country. In other districts also, we had to operate between two groups, fighting each other, maintaining complete neutrality. Our staffs were resolute, and with their strong support, we succeeded in expand, expanding our operation in those remote areas. We were able to develop a poverty reduction model, which is people-based, people-driven, and is result-oriented. This experiment increased our faith on the creativity of the people. During conflict, we realized that our efforts would not be enough to heal the wounds and needed to be treated with compassion because enough hatred was generated amongst different segments of the society. Those in power had exploited the poor for too long, and for that reason, it was easier to galvanize 
the anger against powerful class and launch a class struggle on Marxist principles. We strongly believe in harmony model where poor need to be treated with equality and justice and enable them to be effective citizens in the society. We believe in building democracy from grassroots and the community organization acting as primary school of democracy. We needed a strong structure in the form of multi-sectoral fund, which can directly support community initiative without going through the bureaucracy. It took almost 12 years of long battle and advocacy to convince the rulers that such fund was necessary. And finally, Poverty Alleviation Fund was set up in 2004 with World Bank assistance. Our journey to this stage has been difficult and arduous, but faith and confidence on people's power kept us going and we become, became more resilient. We believe we need to forge alliances within and outside to mobilize support for the cause of poor so that they become subjects and not objects of development. Recognition in the form of Right Light View Labute Award 2010 has strengthened our cause and given us new hope to continue our journey till the mission of er eradicating the poverty is achieved. We need the support of all of you, including media, for highlighting the plight of the poor and also give us strength in removing poverty. In closing, I want to quote Nelson Mandela, who said, I quote, the, to overcome poverty is not act of charity. It is an act of justice. I unquote. Therefore, time has come to do justice to the poor. Thank you all.
Dear award recipients, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Anita Brodén and I'm a member of the parliament for the Liberal Party. It's a great, great honor for me to present Bishop Irving Kreutler from Australia and Brazil. Irving Kreutler has secured the inclusion of indigenous peoples' right into the Brazilian constitution. He also worked hard to save the forest in Amazonas and to stop the controversial energy project Belo Monte Dam. Irving Kreutler took legal action against the criminal group involved in sexual abuse of children. He take the side of the powerless and oppose the exploiters. Even if Erwin Kreutler's outspokenness had put him at constant personal risk, he is convinced that another world is possible in which indigenous, poor, and powerless people finally shall live in dignity and peace. The floor is yours. Mr. Speaker, honorable members of the parliament, Dear recipients of the Right Livelihood Award, Excellencies, dear friends. In the very special and unique moment, I traverse the Atlantic Ocean in thoughts and emotions. I am leaving Stockholm for the Southern Hemisphere and embarking on the majestic Amazon, sailing up the river to reach one of its major tributaries, the Shingu River. For 45 years, I have journeyed with the people in that region. They are the indigenous people who have lived there for thousands of years. They are the river people who have their homes on the riverbanks. They make their, uh, their living from fishing and small family farming. They are the thousands and thousands of families who have migrated from all the states of Brazil in search of better living conditions during the last decades. decades. They are the people to whom I dedicate my life. They are the people whom I love and I know. And they are the people who love me. The reason for that is simple. 45 years ago in 65, 1965, when I came to Brazil, to Amazonia, to the Xingu, they realized that I did not come in search of wealth and advantages. I came to serve these daughters and sons of God. They are women and men who journey with me. Together, we defend their dignity, human rights, and our environment, our common home on Mother Earth. Ecology, from the Greek oikos, means home. These people know very well that, all, that they will not survive if Amazonia continues to be disrespected and raised. And they know that planet Earth will suffer irreversible consequences by this cruel destruction. This will be the true apocalypse. It is a fact that those who are against the unscrupulous destructions of environment, against those who have not the slightest respect for the human being, against those who seek immediate and incredible profits, who oppose their ambition, uh, am ambitions to many politicians and entrepreneurs, put their life at 
their lives at risk. Slander, defamation, and death threats are the weapons to frighten and silence those who raise their voices against the aggressions to human dignity. This is one of the reasons why the public security authorities decided to put me under the protection of military pol police of the state of Pará uh, on June 20, 29th, two, uh, 2006. These authorities considered themselves responsible for the physical integrity of the Bishop of the Xingu. From that day on, on armed military police accompany me wherever I am and go in my home region around the Xingu. This evening, they have a day off. <laughs> I accept the right livelihood award in the name of those who fight with me today on behalf of the indigenous peoples, Amazonian human rights. I accept it also in the name of dozens of people who have given their lives, whose blood, blood has been spilled, and who were brutally assassinated because they opposed the systemized destruction of Amazonia. Among those murdered, I cite two people who worked with me side by side. U.S. American-born Sister Dorothy Meistang lived 23 years on the Trans-Amazon Highway and was murdered uh, there in 2005. I remember my first meeting with her in 1982 uh, very well. She said, I want to work among the poorest of the poor. It was the first time that someone spoke to me this way. And I told her several things to give her an idea about the reality on, at the Xingu. To my amazement, she didn't ask any further questions and started to live in the midst of the poor. From time to time, she returned to Altamira to get contact with representatives uh, of the administration to demand the rights of the farmers and denounce abuses and threats from land robbers and lar large landholders. It didn't take so that, that long for the first threats to appear. The self-called called owners of the lands began to slander and defame her. This difficult, tiring, and most exhausting life, Dorothy lived until that fateful Saturday, February the 12th, 2005 until 7.30 in the morning when she was shot. This crime was programmed in minute details. Those responsible for the death were not those men who were convicted and who are in jail. It was the 15th of February 2005 when I buried Sister Dorothy. Never in my life have I felt my heart so invaded by so many sentiments. Even today, I can't describe what I really felt at that moment. The second person I want to remember here today is Ademir Alfeo Federici, called Dema. For many years, a new category of conquistators has appeared in Amazonia. They are the notorious land grabbers who usurp public lands. They use paramilitary forces to defend their interests. They are political and financial, uh, they use political and financial uh, influence to maintain their ownership of immense uh, areas of land. The families of small farmers are targeted by these so-called proprietors. One of uh, these victim, uh, victims was Dema. He rose, up, uh, uh, he rose up against the proprietors. As a community leader, he always defended the rights of the small farmer, farmers and fought for better days for the rural men and women. On August 23rd, 2001, 
Dema wrote a letter in support of the investigative work the, of the uh, federal police was doing on the land grabbers. Two days later, he was brutally shot in his home in Altamira. He fell down in front of his wife, Maria da Peña. His last words were, Maria, take care of our, our children. Then he passed away. Until today, the investigation of Dema's murder has not been completed. He was killed because he raised his voice, voice against the hydroelectric project of Belo Monte. The Belo Monte project uh, appears to, to be a sacrosanct, unquestionable, and assumes the air of being a veritable historical subject. Human beings, families, and communities are not longer protagonists of their own history. They were not heard. They were silenced before the project was planned and elaborated in Brasilia, a project that, project that never took into consideration the legitimate rights and preoccupations of the population of the Xingu. All those who are quoting this project are immediately labeled as enemies of progress and against development. It's amazing that we think of, uh, when we think of the size of uh, Amazonia, a little more than half the size of the whole Brazil, that the principal problem has to do with the ownership, the possession and use of land. A majority of the other problems have their roots in this principal problem. Rural, uh, rural violence is uh, linked in the concentration of land ownership and the most shameful impunity with which the criminals are honored. They kill and nothing happens. If they are arrested, they will be released the next day. If they are convicted, they are circulating freely on the street on the next day. There is a lack of public policy to encur that encourages the preservation of Amazonia. This gigantic bioma, Amazonia is unique and the biodiversity is exceptional. Nothing in the whole world exists that is comparable on the, to the region, uh, the marvel of God's creation. Brazil is responsible for the largest part of this bioma, Amazonia. Another huge, huge, uh, huge problem is the trafficking of human beings. Youth, young people of both sexes are lured with promises of a better life and ample wages in the exterior. And they are caught in the international network of prostitution. They dream of waging, waging a better life they have dreams for the future, but they are forced to live in the hell of slavery and brutality. Child prostitution in Amazonia is often organized by people from the upper strata of society. They are polit politicians, business people, and merchants. They lure, promise, use, and abuse, and nothing happens to these sexual criminals. Corruption is their language. This award has been given to me because of my commitment on behalf of the indigenous people, their human rights and dignity. I have always found a specific mission in defending these people, who are the survivors of centuries of massacres. In the de decade of the 80s, in the context of the National Constitutional Assembly, we considered it our goal to implement indigenous rights in the federal constitution. It was essential to encourage the indigenous people's own leadership to assume their own protagonist, protagonist action and to write their own story. We started to build an alliance between the indigenous people and organizations of the non-indigenous society. Tonight, I take the opportunity to all the international community's attention, to call all, to call the international community's attention to the, to the pain, 
despair and insecurity of the Guarani Kiowa people in South Mato Grosso. The indigenous people are confined in small areas. Their young people see no prospect for the future, and, they, and uh, the suicide rate among them, among them is alarmingly high. Factory owners who use modern slave labor are treated like heroes by the official uh, administration. I am totally worried about the violation against Guarani Kiowa. The current government is ignoring this cruel genocide in progress before their eyes. But we must not close our eyes to these crimes. Ladies and gentlemen if, uh, of the jury, I gratefully accept your word on behalf of all these women and these men. And there are three persons from Brazil here. I would like to... São três pessoas do Brasil que estão aqui. Eu queria que mostrassem. É. I would like to, to thank all those who have supported me during the last uh, years and those who have proponed uh, pro my work to the Right uh, Livelihood Award jury. I would like to express my deep gratitude for the Right Livelihood Award. I'm honored with the award at the moment when our struggle on behalf of the indig indigenous people, dignity and human rights are taking on new dimensions and greater importance in the face of the development project, project, projects that threaten Amazonia. Those anti-ecological pro projects of enterprise will have a huge and destructive impact on everyone sitting here in Stockholm this evening, all the people living on the earth. I am honored to accept this award by the Right Livelihood Foundation and uh, as inter international recognition and support for our total commitment to this work. And I promise to continue for a long, as long as God grants my life. Thank you very much and God bless you.
last year or their student period, and they will take the exam in the spring. And uh, in a couple of, well, about two months, we will go to South Africa and have a concert tour there. And uh, we will continue with the spiritual uh, for you. Didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Anneli Enoxson, and I'm also a member of the Parliament, and I represent the Christian Democratic Party. Resist and mobilize and transform are some of the keywords for Nemo Basi. And it seems as if he has always tried to combine academic, arts, and action in his work. When he studied architecture in Nigeria in the late 70s, he became aware of unjust economic relations and wanted to work for Chings. In the 80s, he got involved in human rights issues and wrote articles and made cartoons in the way to uh, rise attention. In the 90s, the particular relationship between environmental rights and human rights became very clear to him in the context of the Niger Delta, where peaceful protest against pollution by big oil corporations often ended up in violent repression. This was when he, together with others, built up environmental rights action but also time when he had to go into hiding. 
and a time when his book, Poems on the Run, was published. Keep the oil in the soil, the coal in the hole, and the oil stand in the land are words one can hear from Nemo Basi, recently re-elected chair for Friends of the Earth International. He has a way with words, this man. Please, Nemo Basi, welcome up to deliver your words of this evening. Good evening, Honorable Deputy Speaker, members of Parliament, Excellencies, recipients of the Right Livelihood Award, dear friends, I stand before you today not just as an individual, but as a representative of suffering peoples in the oil fields of Nigeria and in oil fields around the world. I stand before you representing peoples oppressed and devastated by the unyielding claws of mineral and other resource extracting companies in the backwaters of the world. These people I represent may be faceless, but today, in all humility, I stand to salute their courage and to declare that the recognition of my struggles by the Right Livelihood Award Foundation is a clear recognition of the just cause of the resistance of the marginalized peoples who subsidize the world's insatiable loss for fossil fuels with their own blood and at the cost of their environment and means of livelihood. I stand on the shoulders of heroes of the struggles and recall at this time a very striking stanza of the national anthem of my country, Nigeria, which says, the labors of our heroes past shall never be in vain. I salute the courage of Ken Sarawiwa and all the other heroes who took the non-violence resistance path and laid down their lives in the process. Their labors shall indeed not be in vain. With about 60% of the world's crude oil reserves already exhausted, it is stunning to see policymakers believing they can run into eternity on less than half a tank. The search for crude oil and other fossil fuels has meant increasing focus on fragile ecosystems, including offshore locations, nature reserves, and other protected areas. While the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change gathers the nations of the world to talk about how to tackle climate change, the real structural causes as catered and unacknowledged. With the world running on the machines of competition and massive consumption, it is clear that we need more than one planet to meet humankind's appetites. It is also clear that for current levels of extraction, accumulation, and consumption, ethics have to be overthrown and impunity enthroned. It could not be otherwise because as the world seeks cheap energy, someone has to pay for it. With regard to the fossil fuel sector, those paying the price others enjoy are the communities on whose territories oil is found, the degraded environments, and of course, the global atmosphere. Last year, the Copenhagen Climate Conference ended up with an accord that was more like a cord lashed across bent backs of poor countries. Indeed, many were pressured to sign up or lose financial support. What will Cancun throw up? We're waiting to see at the end of this week. The drive to produce more and consume more continues to promote the release of more carbon into the atmosphere, leading to the climate crisis that the world is confronted with. The struggle to win the world of crude oil addiction has taken many forms and shapes. Recent milestones include the expulsion of Shell from Ogoniland in Nigeria in 1993, and the Yasuni ITT Reserve Project in Ecuador, where the government has proposed to leave this, the oil in the soil in exchange for half the value of that oil. 
and that value is 7.2 billion US dollars. In Africa, a great movement of community activists are demanding that new oil be left in the soil to avoid the sort of scandalous environmental pollution and violent conflicts that the oil industry has hashed in Nigeria's Niger Delta. This demand is also being made as a direct pointer to the way climate change must be fought, cutting emissions at the source and sequestering the carbon where Mother Earth left it. The world was awakened to the polluting propensity of the oil industry by the Deepwater Horizon explosion and a company spill in April 2010 by BP. The massive scale of the accident and the attendant media focus made it impossible for the responsible corporation to shake responsibility. Contrast that with the case of the Niger Delta, where Shell claims that an incredible 98% of the pollution is caused by third parties, principally poor local people. The game of blaming the victim has been the style of the all multinationals operating in places such as the Niger Delta. And such blames have not always ended in the mass media. Some have led many to gross violence that have taken the lives of several people and sometimes decimation of communities. Climate crimes, environmental pollution, and other acts of impunity would not end as long as people believe they can assault Mother Earth and escape accountability. The preservation of the planet and the enjoyment of fundamental human as well as socioeconomic rights would not be attainable until and unless the rights of Mother Earth are respected. It is with this understanding that we applaud Ecuador for having already enshrined the rights of Mother Earth in their constitution. And indeed, about a week ago, I, along with other eco defenders from around the world, sued BP in the Constitutional Court of Ecuador for harm to nature in the Deep Sea Horizon oil spill. At the moment, a proposal is before the United Nations to bring into existence the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. Such rights would not be easy to attain in a world where relations are built or destroyed on the altar of competition and rapacious exploitation. It will take a change of heart on the part of humans to understand that just as we have rights, so does the Earth. Sustainable development will remain a mere phrase as long as people see sustainability as merely relevant to keeping their prof profit margins on the rise. It is time for global recognition that any harm inflicted on the planet directly corresponds to throwing the future of every inhabitant of the planet into jeopardy. Climate change is a clear manifestation of what can happen when a mode of civilization is driven by factors that are clearly destructive. The fossil fuels driven civilization has driven humanity to the brink, often termed the tipping point with regard to the climate crisis. The time has come for action to be taken to reverse the trend. The time has come for the world to look away from the carbon driven development part and its governing mentality. It is time to end carbon offsetting and carbon speculations as solutions to climate change. We have to see trees for what they are and not pretend that they are nothing more than carbon stocks. The false solutions being paraded at the conference of the parties going on at Cancun can get as shocking as when organized climate crimes are rewarded with carbon credits and cash. An, ins an insulting example is one where the World Bank plans to extend support from the carbon trade route to gas flare projects in the Niger Delta. The unethical base of this scam can be seen in the fact that gas flaring has been an illegal act in Nigeria since 1984. And there's no way the halting of an illegal activity should end carbon credits, except if the entire carbon trade bazaar is a scam. It is time to say no to the pretense that agrofuels can replace fossil fuels or that they are renewable and green when it is clear that they are not. The focus on agrofuels has led to massive land grabs in Africa. This has meant marginalization of the poor, pressures on food supplies, diversion of land from food crop production, 
deforestation, and abuse of human rights, to mention just a few. It has also been seen by the biotech industry as a crack in the door, allowing them to introduce genetically engineered crops where such would ordinarily be resisted and rejected. It is time to establish an international climate crimes tribunal, as proposed by the People's Agreement, drawn up in April 2010 at Cochabamba, Bolivia. Such a tribunal would function in a way comparable to the International Court of Justice, where crimes against humanity are tried. The Climate Crimes Tribunal would try any sort of environmental crime that harms Mother Earth and does the right of the people to a safe environment. This would be seen as crimes against humanity. Culprits to be tried would include polluters, such as those in the extractive industry. It would also put corporations as well as their directors in the dock for climate and environmental crimes, which are in effect crimes against humanity. Permit me at this point to remember a man who fought courageously against environmental damage by a dangerous machinery of state and the corporations. Ken Sarawiwa, who received the Right Livelihood Award in 1994, a year before he was hanged by the military that was in power in Nigeria then. He stood for nonviolent resistance to erosion of environmental rights and socio-political justice. Although he lost his life at the hands of undemocratic forces, the party charted remains the only way viable, the only viable option and way out of the Niger Delta quagmire. I salute the courage of all those who towed this path for the resolution of conflict. I salute the suffering communities and peoples resisting destructive extraction. It is their courage that sustains our struggle. In solidarity, we march ahead and we will not give up. Thank you very much. Blood will flow when flesh and steel are one, drying in the color of the evening sun. Tomorrow's rain will wash the stains away, but something in our minds will always stay. Perhaps this final act was meant to clench a lifetime's argument That nothing comes from violence and nothing ever could For all those born beneath an angry star Lest we forget how fragile we are On and on the rain will fall like tears from a star like tears from a star On and on the rain will say How fragile we are How fragile we are
blood will flow when flesh and steel are one drying in the color of the evening sun tomorrow's rain will wash the stains away but something in our minds will always stay Perhaps this final act was meant to clench a lifetime's argument That nothing comes from violence and nothing ever could For all those born beneath an angry star Lest we forget how fragile we are On and on the rain will fall Like tears from a star, like tears from a star On and on Fragile we are On and on The rain will fall Like tears from a star Like tears from a star On and on The rain will sing How fragile we are How fragile we Ladies and gentlemen, um, it was a wonderful evening. Uh, you have listened to the speech from the laureates of the Right Livelihood Award, and the message is clear. You can make a difference. So let me remind you about this paper that Jacob showed you. If you want to support the Right Livelihood Award, make it now, make it today. I would like to thank you all for tonight. We now want to, uh, welcome those of you who have re registered for the buffet to join for the meal across the hallway. I would like to point out the flowers used for the ceremony are fair trade flowers. You, s you can see we can make a difference. So thank you all and good night. <laughs>